Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is August 16th, 2010, and my guest is Mike Munger of Duke University. Mike, welcome back to Econ Talk. It's always great to be on the show. Mike, you spent part of this summer in the land of Chile, uh, a country you had visited before, and we did an earlier podcast on the Chilean bus system. So I thought we would start this podcast revisiting that with some observations that you have now that you've been back and some time has passed after the system had been changed by some government policy uh, changes uh, recently. And I wanted to get your impression. So why don't you start by telling us, reprising uh, and summarizing the earlier podcast, uh, what you had seen happen there in an attempt to improve the system. What was the system like before that? I was there nearly three weeks this time and rode the bus a whole lot and had quite a bit of a chance to think about how things have changed. In the mid-2000s, uh, this was well after the Bachelet uh, presidency and La Consultación as a center-left coalition that was ruling the government, they were worried that the bus system in Santiago, which is a city of about 5 million people, wasn't serving the needs of those people. And they had three main objections. One is that the drivers of buses were too greedy in a way, we would recognize it now as a common pool resource problem or call it overfishing. So a driver might see two or three blocks ahead, uh, 50 people waiting at a bus stop, and then another bus pulls up beside them. They rev their engines, and what happens after the light turns green looks a lot like the Roman chariot race scene in Ben-Hur, where they try to run each other off the road, because the first one to get there gets all the 50 people. And this is a... This was a private system run by private entrepreneurs, right? And that it was competitive. They had more than 3,000 different private bus companies. I'm not saying 3,000 private buses. 3,000 private bus companies all competing with each other for different levels of service and different routes. And the routes were not what anyone told anybody to drive. The routes were wherever you thought you could make money by picking up passengers. So the first problem was was driver greed and competition that was destructive. And one of our themes today, I think, is going to be, is competition always, sometimes, never destructive? Well, in this case, they thought that competition was destructive. There were a lot of injuries, uh, fender benders, as these buses uh, jostled with each other to try to pick up passengers. Second problem was pollution. The buses were not very well regulated. It was hard to find all of the, since they weren't licensed really, it was hard to find and uh, fine all of those buses that didn't have uh, proper pollution control equipment. And pollution was getting r- rapidly bad in the basin of Santiago because uh, like Denver and some other places, you get a t- an inversion, particularly in the winter. Uh, it's an enclosed valley. Third thing that they were worried about, and you'll laugh, I think, was profits. They were very upset that anybody was making profits because it seemed like extortion or exploitation that a public, what should be a public bus system was making $60 million U.S. in profits per year. Now, I look at that and I say, you mean a major metropolitan mass transit system was operating in the black? Yeah, that, that's pretty unusual, and I, I should just add a- I don't think profit mongering is a very what kind of mongering? Uh, profit mongering. <laughs> I don't want nothing, mongering of any kind here. It's nothing to laugh at, Mike. So, now of course, the, here are these people, typically low income, without cars, waiting for buses, and being exploited potentially in the eyes of the some of the politicians by these greedy bus systems and bus companies that are, of course, profiting from their need. It, it was a competitive system. And the the fares were quite low, and one of the things so. that one of the things that people talk about now was uh, buses would move along pretty quickly and pick up a couple passengers, and they would open the back door, and somebody would get in the back, and the person would hand up their 
2,000 peso note. It would go up to the front. Next stoplight, the driver would take it, make change, and hand back the ticket, and it would be hand, like, a, like a hot dog at a baseball game. So there was a lot of trust present in that system. Yeah, I'm, so that was the system. There was also some concern, I think, about the, quote, inefficiency of it, wasn't there? This is usually a worry that people make about these kind of systems that emerge rather than are designed from the top down, that, you know, routes are duplicated. Obviously, it'd be more efficient to only have one bus. Uh, other times, there'd be people waiting for a relatively long time rather than having it be synchronized. So I assume that was another issue. You could probably add a couple more things. They would say that there were there was congestion. Yeah. Uh, there were too many of these buses. And paradoxically, people had to wait too long because they didn't go on the routes that people would want. Now, I've always I mentioned I didn't mention that one because I find it strange. What the government saw was it was inefficient. But from their perspective, a lot of these buses ran parallel to metro routes, which meant that if the metro got stopped, the metro is the subway. Yeah, the metro is the subway. What a beautiful subway system. There was a lot of redundancy in the system. Um, If you want something to work, you want to have backup and redundancy. So what the government wanted was a more efficient system, and they wanted a hub-and-spoke system. So the buses would pick up people in neighborhoods and go to the nearest metro stop, drop people off. People would go down, get on the metro, and then at their destination, get off and take another bus. Because then you increase ridership on the metro. Well, I think... Just a a quick comment before you then talk about the policy changes. It's always a question as to how important these concerns were relative to other concerns that would be less attractive, right? So you say that buses would often stampede toward bus stops and and get into accidents, and you want to know how prevalent that was, right? So those are the kind of things – Usually a bus driver would want to avoid. Yes, they'd like to hurry and get to the stop, but they don't want to wreck their capital. So when we hear about these kind of complaints, you always wonder how – what the ratio is, right? Is this you know one, one a day, one a week, one a month? I did, um, I did some research on that, and there were relatively few serious automobile accidents in Santiago during this period. But the number of minor pedestrian accidents was as high as Mexico City. So there actually is some evidence in favor of the thesis. Well, but is that people hit by buses or hit by cars? A lot of them were hit hit by buses, and it really stood out. There was both a time series and cross-sectional difference. There seemed to be a problem with that was largely caused by the bus system and other kinds of increasing congestion. You could say that it's increasing congestion because the country was becoming more and more affluent and there were more More, people with cars. And then the whole combination of roads and uh, and customs, habits of driving hadn't adjusted. I was there in the summer, I think, of 1980. Uh, no, 77. And it was really frightening to be in a vehicle there. Um, I'm sure it's only gotten worse. Um, people drive then drove extremely differently than folks in America drive unless you're talking about New York City. Unless you're talking about New York or yeah. Washington. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the government looked at this problem. They felt it was an opportunity to improve the bus system if we put the most glossy, attractive uh, shine on it. And so what did they do? Well, and they we're actually, talking about 2000. I, I think they, they genuinely were concerned that a lot of people were being harmed and that profits in particular were a bad way of doing this, uh, that were, there was exploitation in the system. So they said... Let's publicize this. And so they moved from a private to a public bus system. They bought these enormous bendy buses from Volvo. And a bendy bus looks like it's got an accordion in the middle. It looks like two buses that are attached by an accordion in the middle because it's going to be more efficient, as you said before, that you've only got one bus instead of four or five. And they decided that the, the they should take incentives out of this. The drivers now were being paid based on how many passengers they picked up, and that meant that the drivers were driving too aggressively. Let's not do that. Let's pay them based on how on time they are. And let's also change the route system so we have hub hub and spokes. And we'll do this all in February. February in Chile is like August in Washington or Germany, where basically it closes. That's the beginning. That's the end of their summer. 
and everybody's on vacation. And so if you could, you could lie down in the middle of the street in February and not really have a problem. And what year are we talking about, roughly? 2007. Okay. February of 2007, they implement the new policy, and the average commute immediately goes from 40 minutes to an hour and 40 minutes. The average commute by a bus rider or by a car rider? The average commute by people using the mass transit okay. system. So uh, really bad set of outcomes that surprises everybody because it was such it, a good system. And, and it's, Well, it, they didn't know if it was a good system, but they knew they had the best of intentions. They really wanted to try to make things better. The problem was, well, let's let the listeners think for a second. The drivers are being paid based on how on time they are. So suppose you're a driver. Traffic's gotten a little bit worse because since the average commute on mass transit went up, people started using a substitute called private cars, taxis. So congestion goes through the roof. Since they can't get there on the bus, they start using private cars, uh, basically illegal taxis. They started riding together. But there's a lot more cars on the road. So you're a bus driver, and you see ahead of you a whole bunch of people waiting at the bus stop, and they've been there for an hour. Do you stop? No. <laughs> Absolutely not. It just didn't you, stop. Because you've already missed your timeliness on that, on that arrival point. You might be so able to make it up because right. they're, they're assuming time at each stop. To, to load and messages. sure. So you, so you, you just shoot right by them. You to shoot the, right by them and you shoot by the next one. You shoot by the next one. To the delight of the people in line. By the they're, they're, they're cheering, in fact. They said, oh, thank goodness, another bus has passed us. Another half-full bus well, has they're, passed us. They're, they're, no, they're thinking, uh, maybe this one will be on time. Go, go, go. <laughs> yeah, because they, they, they mostly care about the welfare of the driver. Well, and the whole system being working well. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so go ahead. That'd um, be one, they, that's, they, a negative, they, that's a negative unintended consequence. That, that, that is. Also, the, the streets in Santiago, which is an old city, are not really wide enough for those big bendy buses. So accidents, if anything, went up because the only way you can turn in one of those bendy buses is from the middle lane. Whether you're turning left or right, you can't be in that lane. Car pulls up. People still drove very aggressively, as you saw. And you just take the front. I saw this happen myself. Uh, just took the, the front bumper right off. <laughs> With a little tiny car, giant bus. You, know, you see the car rock, and then the fender flies, the bumper flies. Oh. I actually saw it myself while I was there. That's sad. Um, <laughs> it's well, sad it's now, as you laugh, but it, it's a, it, it, you can't plan this without using information. So the, the planners object- decided they were going to live in the world they wanted to live in, what, rather than using any of the information they had about the routes people actually wanted to use or the buses that could operate efficiently on those routes. The other problem, if I remember, was the um, coordination between the buses and the metro and the overlapping uh, Disappearing was actually there a were, there, were, there were two problems that they did solve. It had been that the metro was operating at 80% capacity. It immediately went to 120% capacity. People hanging literally on the strap hangers. Just fights. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> People desperate to get on because they're going to get fired. And the other problem they solved was profits. Yep. It, it now loses $600 million per year. Ah. Uh. So instead of operating in the black, it now takes a subsidy of at least $100 for every citizen in Santiago just to have a bus system, not to pay to use it, but just to have it. Now, I wanted to see if the claims that had been made about this were correct. So two years after we had our last podcast and I wrote about this, I rode the bus every day, and I went to a number of different parts of town. It would often take me more than an hour to get on. And when I did finally decide I was going to get on, it was because I'm 6'1", and I weigh 260 pounds. <laughs> I can swim. I can swim past abuela, past grandma. I'm, I'm not proud of this. I, always, I, I saw women crying and pushed aside. Little children stepped on. Uh, Social capital is breaking down because sad. the incentive is you don't get to exchange your money for a ride. What you, what you do is you exchange a small amount of money for a chance to push your way on. And I saw sometimes eight or ten half-full buses pass large groups of people. And they're furious. They're ready to fight. Oh, Mike, this is on this last trip. This is just a month this is, this is three weeks ago. Yeah, so, uh, I saw it myself firsthand dozens of times. So I'm puzzled by this. Two, two things that I find strange. 
based on your analysis, of course, you're an economist, you're wise, um, you're a fine person, you eat right, so your brain... I eat a lot, at least. Well, I'm thinking like fish, you know, probably eat a lot of fish, which is yeah. evidently is tremendous for the brain, at least according to P.G. Woodhouse. <laughs> uh, so to me, he hearing your story, and, and, and I remember when we talked about this before, the administration in Chile was very embarrassed by this and publicly admitted that they'd messed up. Apologized. And, which is very unusual. Yep. So you'd think there'd be two things you'd do right away. The first thing is you'd get rid of that pay the bus drivers for their timeliness and their promptness. And the second thing would be to get rid of those bendy buses, which must be an enormously bad decision. Yes, it's hard to phase out expensive capital. That you, It's hard to admit you made a mistake. But those two things would seem to be easy to fix. Now, have either of those changed? They they pay the bus drivers more now in a lump sum, but everything at the margin is based still on how, how on time they are. And they still have the bendy buses. And they still have the bendy buses because they, they have decided they're more efficient. That's what they bought, yeah. Um, and so what's the public stance of the administration based on this horrific – I mean, it sounds like everyone's furious still. Well, there's a new administration. There's, oh. um, the, the Bachelet administration and La Concertacion had – a, a dozen policy failures like this, where with the best of intentions, they said, let's try this. And when it was a failure, they said, we just didn't do it enough. Let's do it more. And it failed again. So they lost. And the, the new Piñera administration is a center-right uh, group, uh, a majority in Congress also, and they're looking to change it. The problem is it's not clear how to change it at the margin. It's, it, it is not politically popular to go back to a fully private system. So how can you change it at the margin? And I have some ideas about that, and I got a chance to talk to some government officials. There's a famous book called Curb Rights. Dan Klein and two other people wrote uh, 10 or 12 years ago. And in it, they point out that the main thing you need to prevent the overfishing of uh, passengers is private bus stops. So all you need is a private system with private bus stops, and we basically have that now. The police prevent people from being picked up at anything except a real bus stop. And uh, licensing for buses to make sure that they don't pollute. If they move to a private system with those provisions, all you'd really need is one more thing, and that's a ticketing system that gives you monthly discounts so that you don't have the, you, you're not able, it's not profitable, to try to poach somebody else's passengers. What do you mean monthly? Why, why is that the monthly? I thought that would be the private stops. Each company would have its own oh, you, could, you, you could have private stops. Uh, it's too expensive to have private stops everywhere. But, so what do so, you mean? Why, what would the role of a monthly discount be for? Well, I, I have a, the, the Smith bus company normally charges a dollar to pick up a passenger, let's say. But I can sell a monthly pass for $20. But nobody else is going to honor that because okay, they can't get money I for see. it. Okay. So let me ask you do, you, do you speak Spanish? I do. So did you talk to individuals uh, on the buses about their feelings about yes. it? And what were their thoughts? Uh, did it, they understand – I think the single most important thing, did they understand that uh, – tell me what the fear was today relative to the past. In somewhat real terms, and whether people understand that the difference is being made up by taxes, you know, you understand? Yes, they thought they, they thought that what was needed was more buses and better bus drivers. Uh huh. No, yeah. not none of them thought that I that I thought wanted to return to the old system. Interesting. Why Nobody you... wanted a private bus system because their memories of that were horrific. Because the accidents. Their perception, at least, of the accidents and the pollution. Okay. So that, as you say, that non-marginal quantum leap, that discrete change is politically impossible. No support at all. Uh, so, the, of course, the real policy question would be improving that versus improving the current system is really what the choice is, right? You could improve – you could do some things to make the private system work better, as you just talked about. But since that sounds um, – hard for folks to absorb, they're going to stick with the current system and hope they can tweak that. They have a, they have a, a taxi system where uh, taxis can take up to four passengers at once and drop them off at different places. So it's a sort of hybrid jitney system. 
and I would what I would do at the margin is expand that to minivans that could take six or eight passengers. That would take a lot of the pressure off. So we have a, a kind of like a super shuttle right. that we have in the United States. Did you ride the Metro? Often. And how, was it super crowded all the time? It was very crowded all the time. It's a it's a really beautiful system. Their Metro is tremendous. And I, I rode it almost everywhere. And very cheap, very fast, always on time. And crowded, but not impossibly crowded, except uh, right at rush hour, since I could avoid that, but you know, a, a regular worker can't avoid that. You have to go at rush hour. That's when your job starts and stops. Right. And had you ridden it before under the old system? Yes. Wasn't one of your insights from the last podcast that the duplication of the bus systems along the metro routes allowed for an, uh, an excess capa- an op- excess capacity that was needed during rush hour that was allowed the system to essentially be more flexible, and that must have disappeared. Because the private bus companies would add routes at times when it was needed, so they reduced the peak load problem, yes, yeah. and now it, it's all on the metro, and or the, the surface roads, because a lot, a lot more people do drive now. Yeah. That's fascinating. Any other uh, – did you – by the way, were you going anywhere, Mike, or just riding along – Taking notes and making observations and chatting. Sometimes I was just writing and trying to talk to people. Uh, But a lot of the times I was going up to the university or going downtown to meet with government officials. And uh, once you get used to a mass transit system in a city like that, it's really darn fun. Santiago is just a beautiful place. But it did take a long time, you say. Not as long as driving. (laughs) Traffic's pretty serious. And you could read. Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts on Chile or on their economic system? We're going to hear a lot more, I think, from the Piñera regime, and it is interesting that the, this Chilean regime under President Piñera. When you say regime, it is it's it's a democratically elected. It's a, the president, yes. Yeah. So the administration. The administration <laughs> is is fine. The the, the Piñera administration sees itself as an opportunity to offer an alternative to Hugo Chavez's claim that Latin America can only be organized as a, as a socialist country. And it's interesting to hear what Chavez and people in Peru even will say about Chile. They say, well, you know, you Chileans, you're like the Swiss. You're just different. Those institutions don't, they don't travel well. We, couldn't, we could not have a free market system like you have because you Chileans work too hard. What do you think? I think it's really interesting that Chile didn't have particularly free market institutions until the introduction of the ideas of the Chicagos during the 70s. Now, a lot of bad things, awful things, inexcusable things happened in Chile during the 70s, and I'm not for a moment saying I'm going to defend them. During Pinochet. Yes, but the economic ideas that took hold then were not part at all part of the Chile of the 50s or 60s. So it, it is possible to change. And you can look at Chile as a, a kind of laboratory of the wealth that's created by the adoption of free market institutions in an open economy. It is interesting that that, that era did not poison the public against those the economic policies. Uh, to the contrary. They're, they're, they're basically predisposed towards at least free market economics when it comes to trade. All right. Sure. Very interesting. Well, we will um – I'm sure we'll hear more from you down the road. It's um, it's an interesting, really interesting time there, and see what happens. And of course, we'll see what happens with the bus system, which is what, which was the rare public uh, private bus system in, in the world. There are very few uh, major cities in the world of that size that ha- had anything like a private system. And, yeah, that had that almost a pure private system. Yeah. Yes. Um. Let's okay. So let's shift gears. Although it's not such a big shift, uh, I want to look at uh, a question received from a listener, Robert Eaton, uh, who asked about a previous podcast, though not the one on uh, the bus system, but rather the one that we did on rent seeking. So uh, before we get to Mr. Eaton's question, why don't you talk about what the traditional public choice view is of rent seeking and the waste that it's co- that's caused by it. I guess the way to think of it in my mind is is competition good? 
and economists tend to have a knee-jerk reaction saying competition's always good. One of the things that public choice theorists did was say, well, not so fast. Competition might or might not be good. It depends on the incentives that align what individuals want with what happens as a result to the society. And when we think of competition, generally we're thinking of competition by firms to sell their products to consumers who decide which of these products to buy based partly on quality and reputation and based partly on price. And that's where this idea of consumer sovereignty comes from, because the consumer is in charge, not in any king-like way. They make little, small decisions every day. But the result is that it's a consumer-directed economy, because consumers decide where resources go and who doesn't get resources. They vote with their dollars is the usual way it's described. And it might be a very good way to describe it, because they, some people have a lot more dollars than others to get more votes. And it's kind of stupid because you'd only get one outcome, so never mind. But that is the way it's often described. <laughs> Carry on. The, re- the reason I mention that as important as a, not a good metaphor is because when you vote in an election, you get one outcome. We don't just get rich people getting cars, though. We get rich people getting Lexuses and poor people getting Hyundais that work really, really well. And in Chile, you got some people riding really nice buses that were fairly expensive and poor people riding admittedly yeah. not very good buses that were very convenient to them. Yeah. And the routes that they took were the ones that people wanted, not something that a planner looked at a map and said, that's what we should have. So, but returning to the classic example of rent seeking where competition doesn't work so well with the government, what, what is the, what's, the, uh, what's the analysis there? In economics, we tend, we, as I said, we think of competition as a pursuit of profits. And a company in pursuit of profits may spend resources or even waste resources. If they fail, if they go bankrupt, then a lot of resources were used up. But since it was in the pursuit of profits, we can say the long-run result is that consumers benefit. So maybe that's tolerable. But suppose that the government says, you know, I feel bad for some people. Let's try to give away money. But we want to do it in a way to make sure that the money that we're giving away is used correctly. We don't just want to give it away. That would, that would invite corruption. So we're going to say, you have to write a really long proposal and describe how you're going to use the money. And when we're going to give the money away at the end of that, the competition for the money that we're giving away, which is called a rent, a rent is an artificial amount a prize that's going to be given away. And it might be, as I just said, it might be for we want to give it to the people who are most deserving, or maybe we're just going to give it because we think, as a matter of public policy, we'd like to help someone. We've talked about a lot of examples before on different podcasts. Um, One example might be we want to give away higher wages than the market can support. We want to give away lower price for an apartment than the market would dictate. But usually when we think of of rent-seeking, the example that I've always thought of is the city of Charlotte used to have a whole floor of of its municipal office building whose the people who worked on that floor, their job was to pursue HUD grants, housing housing and urban development grants. They did a study, and it turned out that almost half of the amount of money they were getting from HUD was being spent on paying the salaries of those people who were writing grants to try to get more HUD money. Relatively little of it was going to the citizens who were supposed to be benefited. So what rent-seeking does is create competition for a rent, but since you have to spend the resources in this competition, you may dissipate some or close to all of the amount of the prize that's being given away. And so paradoxically, competition for these artificially created prizes means that you're actually giving away much less than you thought and you're wasting resources because you're giving people an incentive to compete. So in the – and you could even imagine uh, rent-seeking that was so – or that competition was so excessive – and dramatic because the prize was so large that people would spend more money in total than the amount of the prize. Each person might not, but they'd get close, uh, especially in a, the more corrupt I think the regime is. 
depends how violent they are, I guess. But when when a when a regime and here I'll use the word regime, when a regime hands out goodies, and HUD grants are goodies, of course, but we think of it as purely arbitrary, um, then people are going to spend resources flattering and cajoling and befriending the people in power. And those resources, when summed up across all the favor seekers, could actually exceed the amounts that are handed out. And certainly the amounts that are handed out in that case are not producing a social benefit. They're just reordering money towards the regime's friends. And so that would be purely wasteful. It's tempting to think of this as being economically not inefficient because you say, well, it's a transfer. And economists will say, you know, maybe or maybe it may be unjust, but it's not wasteful because it's a transfer. The insight of people who studied rent seeking are going to say it's not a transfer because the transfer is going to be dissipated by the competition to receive it. And as you said, let's suppose there's just two sides. There's a piece of legislation that we're considering. Well, the people who are for it are going to hire lobbyists, and lobbyists are pretty expensive. They have really, really great hair, expensive Italian shoes, nice suits. They have really nice offices. Speak well. They're, they're educated people. These are people who could have produced something real in life. They're doing what makes sense for them because this, is, this may very well be the highest valued use of their time. They can make five, six hundred thousand a year, two million dollars a year being a lobbyist. So from their perspective, this is no different from profits, profit seeking. They're making money. Yeah, it's in their self interest. But it's but the self interest is perverse from the society's perspective, because if we give people an incentive to spend money on rent seeking, we we waste a lot of resources. So both sides spend this money. And there's an interesting old question that George Stigler raised in his article about the economic theory of regulation, the theory of economic regulation. He said, why don't you just see direct transfers? Why don't we pay members of Congress? Well, that's illegal. That's corruption. So instead of paying them, we take them to Vail. We take them out on nice sailboats. We have very attractive young people, sell them, or give them nice drinks, maybe give them back rubs. So if we could give them money directly, it would be horrible, it would be corrupt, but it would just be a transfer. Instead, we have something that we can't give back. And this is, in economics, it's called an all-pay auction because it has the property that, and I've done this in class, you may have done it in class, and if listeners just think about this, how it would work, uh, I hold up a $20 bill in class, and I say, all right, class, how much would you pay me for this? And whoever pays me the most gets it. However... All of you have to pay all of your bids. Right. Whatever you bid, you have to put in an envelope, and whether you win or not, you don't. You lose the envelope. All of you lose all of your bids. So let's suppose there's 30 people in the class. If they each bid one dollar, I get thirty dollars to give away twenty. Now the winner got twenty dollars for one. So that means that somebody else might bid one fifty. You can easily get more than the twenty dollars, as you said before. Now this isn't so inefficient in the sense that it's a transfer. I get thirty for giving away twenty. Yeah, you got the. It's it's still a zero sum game. The the losses of thirty dollars from the class as a whole is divided between uh, the twenty to the winner and the ten to you. So the but rent seeking has two parts, and this is this is a very important one part of them for people's intuition, for the listeners' intuition. It's an all pay auction in the sense that everybody has to pay all of their bids, but they don't get to pay it in money. They they have to pay it in they Time. went to make cookies and I burn all of them. Right. Every, all of the bids after I take the money get destroyed. They get used up or else they get used for me not in money, but in terms of increased luxury, trips to Vail. Uh, they're not purely wasted, perhaps, but they're, they're, all of these resources are used for something that's not their highest valued use. All of those really smart, well-educated, handsome lobbyists. It's one of the reasons I don't regrade homeworks. <laughs> Serious. It's an important point. Yes. When people say to me, you know, this was, it was a five-point question, and my answer was really close to yours, and you only gave me a four. And I'd look when I was first starting. I'd look at it and I'd weigh it. Was it a five? Did I undergrade them? And you'd think, well, justice requires that they should always get a voice to to re-examine their grade because I'm human. I make mistakes. Yeah. But early on, I decided that homeworks would be a small percentage of the grade, partly for this reason. And I said, I don't regrade homeworks. 
well, that's unfair. It is. The yeah. alternative is that you will lobby me. You will beg. Mm-hmm. And not a, there are people in the class who have dignity, too, who will not do something yeah. like that. But the, the least – dig- twice. It wastes a lot of time, and it has a distributional context. Exactly. It rewards the least dignified members of the class, the grovelers, yeah. and who – uh, and and the people who can't appreciate the law of large numbers, and I would say there's a lot of homeworks. When you get a th- when I give you a, f- a five, when you deserved a four, you're not going to come back. Yeah. So there's this. This students don't like to hear this, but well, it's an it, interesting it, it, economic lesson about the fact that it's not free to regrade. It's extremely expensive. And what you do is in fact fair on average, unless for some reason you have a particular bias against the handwriting, student. yeah, or whatever, yeah. Sure. Okay. So go ahead. Well, Do you have anything else to say about that? Then we'll turn to the, to the market question. The, the, the rent-seeking problem that we have raised asks a question that I've actually become fascinated with, and that is, how do you tell? If you find somebody who's going out in, and investing their time in trying to get better at something, and the result is, at least on average, they make money by doing it. Is it profit-seeking or rent-seeking? And we often say, by the way, that... Uh, you know, people acting in their own self-interest are led by an invisible hand to serve society. But we know that in the, certainly in this case and possibly in private cases, the the uh, society is not served. The example I use is theft. Theft yeah. is often described by economists incorrectly as a, as a zero-sum game. Someone comes into your house, takes your television. There's one less television for you but one more television for the thief. It may be immoral. And despicable, but you can't say it's costly on the surface. The problem with that analysis is it's not a zero-sum game. It's a negative-sum game. If I think you might break into my house, I'm going to put locks on my door. I'm going to perhaps have a weapon inside. I'm going to put my TV in a place that's harder for you to find it, et cetera, et cetera. And you're going to invest in skills to be better at breaking into people's houses without getting caught. And all of that extra stuff uh, is the, the net cost of crime. It's not a zero-sum game. And that's, that's what I think, the, the, I use this example in class, and people always shake their heads. But the Coase theorem, which I'm a big fan of in profit-seeking settings, is uh, actually dangerous when it comes to theft. Because I could imagine a guy goes by my door, comes up, he knocks, and he said, I was going to break into your house last night. I had all the stuff. I was going to break the window, and I, I, I probably would have gotten five or $6,000 worth of your stuff, but I could only have fenced it for 800 so I went home, and I thought I would come by and talk to you today. Let's split the difference. <laughs> you just give me $1,500, and I don't break your window. I don't take your You don't have TV. to go rebuy the stuff, yes. And, and we'll, we'll both be better off. So let, let's just do the Cosian thing. Well, no, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because there would be a line of people doing that. The Coast solution doesn't work in a situation where property rights are not specified at all. Right. We have to have clearly specified property rights, and in this case, we do. It's my stuff, and it's not yours, and so theft is not allowed. I want to come back to that on another podcast because that's a very interesting uh, topic. But sticking with this one, I want to read what uh, Robert Eaton said, our, our listener. He says, I'm imagining when MP3 players first came out. Let's say there were three or four so firms making them, including Apple, with their iPod. Clearly, the other two firms didn't up, end up as well, and let's say they go out of business altogether. Well, it's obvious that Apple's a huge success now in this market, perhaps one or two years after the product's inception. It's not obvious to me that the gains by Apple more than offset the losses suffered from the other two companies. So here's a case where there's an implicit prize. It's not a government prize. It's not a HUD grant. It's not a, a goodie dangled by the government that lobbyists are going after. But there's this prize called Portable Music. A bunch of firms compete. There's a winner called Apple. The other two firms lose. It might have been seven or eight firms, actually, in reality. And, of course, some of them still made it somewhat. But there's clearly some firms went out of business. Some firms thrived. How do you know that there's a net gain to society from that competition to serve the customer? Why could you possibly believe it? You look at all of the resources wasted, all of the other companies going out of business, all of the specific research that just went to waste. Wouldn't it have been better for the government to have chosen, here's the standard. We're going to have uh, this kind of MP3 player, and that's it. Yeah. When VHS was competing with Betamax, a lot of listeners don't remember this, but back in the 1930s. Some of us old ones do. (laughs) I remember. 
when, when, when video cassette recorders first came, there were two different sizes, two different standards, and a lot of people. Sony was a very important company, still is, but yeah, they took they an were... enormous hit on insisting that they were going to go with their own standard for uh, cassette tapes, and they called it Betamax. And when that lost out in a network economy fight, uh, an awful lot of people had cassette players, video cassette players, that were useless. And all those engineers at Sony, all those hours spent, all for nothing. Well, what, what about the NBA? Think of all the kids bouncing basketballs mm. instead of studying economics. Yep. And they say, I have some chance of making the NBA. Now, maybe they get the probability wrong. Possible. But, well, even if they don't. But they, 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 even if they have a pretty good assessment of the probability, they, you know, I don't care. I'm going to do everything I can to play in the NBA. Well, there's very few people that make it to the NBA for even a, a single game, much less make a career of it. Isn't that a giant waste to society? All those hours practicing, all those books they read saying it isn't talent, it's all effort, which I'll, well, that's another topic, but yeah. How do you really tell the difference between profit-seeking and rent-seeking? And to me, the answer is that rents are artificially created, and the only feedback that you get is the creating party's decision to award it. So all of the competition is going to is very likely to dissipate more than the total value. But in the case of the NBA, we get an overall improvement of the level of play. And yes, it's a shame that a lot of people waste their time. And in the case of uh, technology, we get increases in technology that we couldn't possibly have dreamed of, whereas if the government had chosen one standard, that would be the standard and new entry would be foreclosed. So the, the fact that this one of them encourages new entry, encourages new products, is the justification for it. But there's a reason why Schumpeter called it creative destruction. There is a lot of destruction in profit-seeking, and I think if, if that's all you look at, then it's easy to conclude we might be better off with regulation. Well, it seems to me the other thing missing, you hinted at it a few minutes ago, um, and I think it's the most important thing, is what, what's called the knowledge problem that Hayek identified. We don't know in advance – which the best technology is. We don't know in advance that the iPod's the best. We don't know in advance that VHS is the best, and some people even argue it's not. I'm skeptical on that, but that's that's just one example. Most of the time, new products come along. I, I like Amazon as an example. When Amazon came along, it lost money year in, year out. Um, my view was, well, it's their money. The investors took their chances in hopes of striking striking it very, very rich. Of course, Amazon's now a profitable firm, and we look back on it and say, well, yeah, they, they, they took losses and they have gains now that compensate them for their losses and then some. And they don't, as we've been pointing out, compensate the other firms that, that may have tried to enter the, the digital marketplace, the retail marketplace, the way Amazon did successfully. We don't have to compensate them. Those investors simply lost their money. Those resources were just used up and nothing good came of them. But it's not really true that nothing good came of them. Those efforts by those other firms pushed Amazon to find the most effective ways. So those ways were discovered, as, as Buchanan has argued in a nice piece on the market process. They weren't specified in advance. They weren't given. They couldn't be looked up in a manual by well, the they, government. They not only were they not known, but they weren't knowable. They weren't exactly. They weren't no one knowable. Could have known. There was no process, no algorithm, no survey that could have told people that, that the iPod's uh, interface was the one that, that people really wanted. And we could have found that out in advance and saved all those other uh, efforts that, that look wasteful. So the point is first that we can't know in advance what the right technology or right product is. And sometimes they don't make it as we know. Uh, the Apple tried the Newton, which was a handheld – a uh, device to help you run your life and do your appointments and take notes. It was a total flop. It was a perfect product except for the fact that nobody really wanted to buy it. Yeah, but shortly thereafter, shortly meaning within I think a decade or so. Before they went bankrupt. Uh, well, I was thinking more of the Palm Pilot came along, which uh, which did the same thing. Yeah, uh, they're, uh, They've struggled since because they've been superseded by the BlackBerry and now the iPad and the, other th and the iPhone and other devices. So that creative destruction, that swirl of – innovation that takes place, no one knows how it's going to come out in advance, and no one knows if it even should come out in advance because some of those are 
dead ends. They cannot be solved with the technology that currently exists or the insights that but, currently exist. But isn't it interesting that the risks then are actually being taken by capital, not by consumers. Some consumers take some small risk. If you're an early adopter, Correct. you may buy a product that turns out not to last very long. But mostly, this is for the benefit of consumers. That's right. They, they don't bear the risk. The risk is borne by, as you say, the risk takers, the, cap, the, the capital folks. Now, the other point I thought that you were implicitly making, and I, I just want to bring it out, let's go back to those HUD grants. Now, if the government's handing out, oh, $25 billion in 250 different congressional districts uh, to do a whole bunch of different projects, and in each of those districts, people are desperately striving to write the most attractive grant, the one that looks the most appealing and also has the most political appeal to the grant hander outers. Well, the fundamental question there is, does it really matter? Does it really matter who gets the grants? Now, if it doesn't – if it literally doesn't matter, then the whole thing is a waste. There's no benefit from all of that competition, and all that is being done is the burning of resources. But if it does matter, then you can say, well, but there's a, counter, there's a, there's a countervailing force on the other side of, of benefit. In the case of innovation in the private market, in the case of the iPad, the MP3 player, Amazon, whatever these – I like to use uh, – Core fam shoes that didn't make it, right? They were short lived. Uh, they're only surviving now in on the feet of military uh, personnel who like them because the core fam was a product that you didn't have to shine. Yeah. It just it looked great all the time. Of course, it didn't breathe, so consumers didn't like it. It was a roll of the dice by uh, I forget the company, but I want to say Dupont, but I'm not sure. It was a roll of the dice. It didn't work out. Basically, they lost a lot of money on it, and it was over. The market fixed it. The market said, don't keep putting money into it, which is another aspect of private competition or profit-seeking that, that is sort of has a self-regulating aspect. If it, if it doesn't produce those net benefits at all, it shuts down very quickly. Because there's feedback, though. There's feedback. The, there's if, the difference. In rent-seeking, you generally don't get feedback. Yeah, so if the government's handing out uh, goodies to people and it doesn't matter whether they're going to the right people, all that matters is, is that the people who are getting them are – politically attractive, then it's all wasted in the private sector. That's very difficult to sustain for very long. Yeah. Well, someone asked me, um, is there ever a circumstance where rent-seeking might a rent-seeking contest might actually be justified? I think the answer sure. is yes. Absolutely. And it, it's when it's difficult to internalize the public benefits of a new discovery. And the, the British government set up a contest to solve the problem of calculating longitude. Because they were having ships run aground. I think it's lat- is it, is it, oh, yeah, longitude. Yes, correct. Sorry. So they, yeah. they, they were having ships run aground. They, the latitude they had, they had been able to solve, but they couldn't longitude. And there were two ways you could do it. One was if you could get sightings on the stars, and the other was if you had accurate uh, timekeeping. You need a clock. And so there were two different av- avenues of trying to calculate what was the best way to do this. Whoever did it wouldn't really be able to patent it and capture the full private benefits of this public good. So the British government set up a bounty of 20,000 pounds, which is the equivalent of more than a million dollars now. It's a huge fortune. And for a relatively uh, simple thing to be able to calculate. And a lot of people worked on it for more than 40 years before finally that money uh, was given out a few different times, actually, because people made important innovations. So that was a rent-seeking contest. Most people wasted all of the research, but it advanced something that really was a public good. So you can think of examples where rent-seeking might produce a public good, but it's not obvious at all that you want to set up rent-seeking contests just for the sake of giving away the prize. The yeah. result needs to be that the research itself has a big public benefit. But it, it really raises – it's a great example. And by the way, you've probably read the book. I've read the book yeah. called Longitude. I think it's by Davis Sobel. We'll put a link up to it. It's a wonderful book, fascinating book. Um, the, the interesting part of this is you know, we, we've kind of glossed over the issue of magnitude. So it's easy to say, well, the MP3 player that I – that Apple came up with is, is, is a delightful device and people get a lot of pleasure from it. That doesn't prove that it, it didn't lead to uh, investments by other firms that outweighed those benefits. We haven't – we've sort of taken that as for granted. And I think the longitude example – and I think it's probably true, but I think the lo- – for reasons I'll 
try to try to make clear in the longitude example helps you see it. With the longitude example, yes, that was an example where a government prize motivated somebody to come up with something that was really glorious, really important, saved a lot of lives. And yes, while there was some cost by the losers, uh, it was probably a great, great investment. At the same time, we could imagine privately offered prizes that were totally mistaken, that are totally wasteful, uh, that are just dead ends. Uh, the only thing that's different between the two is, is the incentives about the size of the prize, and that's extremely important. If you picked a, a – it's true that, that longitude saved a lot of lives, the discovery and, and of measuring it, but you could pick a prize that was too big. You could make a mistake. You could have a, a very important, desirable social end, as opposed to the HUD grants, which probably built a lot of you know dog museums and tennis <laughs> courts that are underused and all it's kinds a teapot of teapot museum. I think in North Carolina, the what a teapot museum. Uh -huh, very well, teapot lovers everywhere swarm to it. I'm sure. Uh, so those those you might be skeptical of the of the ver of the public benefits that are created from that underlying process. Longitude, you you have to you have to say it was a, it was a bargain almost certainly. But you could imagine a prize that was so large relative to the social benefits that even though the outcome was a, was a boon, even though it was something really good that got created as a result, all of the resources that were thrown in by the losers offset that. Well, it now, happens constantly um, in, in England, France, Spain, titles of nobility really weren't worth very much, but – they were very highly valued, and the, the competition for prizes of nobility from the government were something that you could use to get people to do almost anything. So most of the time, the government's in a position to set up these contests where the value that they're giving away in terms of what is going to the, the rent seekers it is very valuable. The, what they're spending on it is going to be, as a consequence of this value, it's going to be in, tremendously wasteful to the society because th there's no social benefit to creating all of these myriad titles of nobility. It is not, it's nothing like longitude. Yeah, so that, that's where the, the benefit itself is relatively small uh, rather than the prize being too big. And what the private sector does, what the profit system does – and I use the example in uh, in the, my book, The Price of Everything, of, say, a, a battery that lasts a lot longer. So I'm sure on your trip you <clears throat> experience this. When I travel, I find the – and even when I'm home, the challenge of keeping all my devices fully charged. I probably even talked about this before. My, my shaver, my Kindle, my phone, my computer – I mean, one of the reasons I don't have an iPad is just I don't want another charger, right? Yeah. So, and one of the reasons I love my Kindle is that it lasts so long on a charge without, if I don't use the uh, the wireless feature from just reading a book on, I can go over a week. So it's so pleasant. So somebody who could figure out a way to make a battery that lasted oh ten times longer at a tenth of the weight mm -hmm. would be a, an extraordinarily wealthy person because of the benefits that that would people would be willing to pay for it. Then competition would come along and the price would be bid down. But that prize that's sitting out there implicitly designed by the marketplace that says make consumers a lot happier about the charging of their devices, the magnitude of the prize, as you pointed out earlier, is set by how much consumers really want it. But there, there's more or less accurate feedback. Now, there would still be consumer surplus, which is what you're saying. I wouldn't capture the full value of it. Correct. But I would capture an enormous value, and the value is correlated. So the, the feedback is accurate. Whereas in a rent-seeking contest, the government has to guess. They just don't have enough information. In fact, it's not knowable. Sometimes they're going to have it too, too low, sometimes too high. Often the result is going to be wasted resources. Well, and I'm also suggesting that the government's in the position of Mike Munger at the front of the class. If it became known that Mike Munger was continually auctioning off $20 <laughs> bills in his classroom for the educational input, of course, but it was found he was taking uh, money from his students – and of course, I mean, it's a great example when you think about it. You do it one time in class. It's a cute little exercise. The students learn something about rent-seeking and probability and risk-taking. If you do it every day. You're a congressman. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're, uh, you're, you invite, you're inviting essentially, by the way, the, the student who puts in the, the $100 bid for the $20 bill uh, who wants a good grade, 
of course, is um, shows just how corrupt the process can be. Let how, how, how quickly it could become corrupt. Yeah. But the, I, mean, I, I say you're a congressman only half in jest. In the previous podcast, we talked about this, but let me remind the listeners, I, I had a friend who worked in the Michigan legislature, and this was in the 70s. At the beginning of every session, they would put maybe 20 bills in the hopper, each of which proposed specific new taxes or regulation on a particular industry. And as soon as they received the contribution from that industry, the bill would be removed from the hopper. Are you serious? Absolutely serious, <laughs> yes. It was just understood that, uh. that this was... this was. And he's a, he was a liberal Democrat. He said, in retrospect, it was a little bit embarrassing, but that was just the way that things worked. And so you set up these competitions. Now, notice that one's pretty efficient, because since it's specifically sectoral, those are just transfers. They were clever enough to say, well, if you know, there's a rent-seeking competition, we'll lose the money. We actually want to be able to have uh, the direct payment, in this case, in the form of a campaign contribution. But you can't always do that. It appears corrupt. And so instead, you get handsome lobbyists and trips to veil. It's still wasteful, though. Yeah, uh, that's called extortion, that first case. It's not well, really so much rent-seeking, but it's You just take liberty. What? What'd you say? I said you just hate liberty to call that extortion. <laughs> um, any other thoughts on uh, on rent seeking or private innovation? The, the, I would reiterate the one thing that we've come up with, and that is the difference is feedback. Not the difference is not the absence of waste in in private markets, because clearly private markets do waste things. Because not long after VHS one. People don't even have video cassette recorders. They have DVDs. Yeah, and Blu-ray players now. It, it's very wasteful. But the difference is that there's feedback in the creation of these new products. You don't really have to guess about the value. The value is correlated with the size of the public good, whereas in rent-seeking, it's not. And also the fact that information is imperfect or unknown. And, and, that we and can't, unknowable. Unknowable. We can't specify in advance, so it, there's no alternative way to get to the Blu-ray player. We couldn't have said back in 1980 when VHS was battling Betamax or whatever year it was, oh, let's not let these guys fight it out. This is wasteful. Let's just go to Blu-ray right now. Yeah. Nobody, we'll, we'll skip ahead because yeah. in 20 years this is what we'll be using. <laughs> and that way we'll save so much, so much. There, there's no uh, – it's really uh, what's called the – I think it was Demsets, the Nirvana fa fallacy, yeah. the idea that we could uh, somehow uh, at zero cost get, get to uh, some kind of outcome. My guest today has been Mike Munger. Mike, as always, thanks for being part of Econ Talk, and I hope you have, as we start on a new school year, a year of great joy and productivity. Thanks. I'm going to stay off the buses for a while. Good choice. Take care. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.